This is episode 236 of the Stem Cell Podcast. The future starts here with Keith Alm, Dr. Hai Fenlin, and Dr. David Scadden. Hey, everybody. We are Daylon and Arun. Welcome back to the Stem Cell Podcast, where we culture knowledge and stem cell research by talking to some of the brightest minds in the field. The Stem Cell Podcast is brought to you by Stem Cell Technologies, a global biotechnology company supporting life science research and fostering communication and collaboration in science. If you enjoy the Stem Cell Podcast, rate us and leave a review. We're always looking for feedback on how the podcast can be improved and for suggestions on guests. Today, we have the leadership of the ISSCR on the podcast to talk about the Society's upcoming annual meeting taking place in Boston, Massachusetts from June 14th to the 17th. We've also got our usual roundup of recent highlights and stem cell news coming right up. But first, stem cell is hiring. Stem Cell Technologies is a world leader in developing services and tools for scientists working in cell biology, regenerative medicine, immunology, cancer, and disease research. United by a foundation of scientific integrity and driven by a mission to advance science globally, Stem Cell is a team of scientists helping scientists. They're looking for creative, driven people to join their international team. Explore more than 80 current offerings in areas such as R&D, sales, business operations, quality, and science communication, all at jobs.stemcell.com. We're going to start things off. Actually, on this particular roundup segment, we've got nothing but neural papers, all neural. And the folks who are going to cover them are people who do not do any neuroscience at all. So this is going to be a trip. This is going to be a good time. We're going to start things off with a cell stem cell paper. This is coming from the lab of Isaac Chen at UPenn. Structural and functional integration of human forebrain organoids with the injured adult rat visual system. This apparently got a lot of popular press, and for good reason. It's a really, you know, it captures the imagination. Let's let's put it that way. So the approach here is making brain organoids, cortical cortical organoids, which we've talked about a lot on the show, from human pluripotent stem cells, and basically introducing them into the injured rat forebrain to replace and restore quote lost eyesight. In the rat. I mean, this is it's a bit of a stretch to to make that particular conclusion, but we can dive into it. So brain organoids have been around for a while. They uh, have many structural features of the developing brain. They're not perfect. They're not even close to perfect uh, that we have discussed in the show. But whether they can actually integrate with the host brain network is a question that has been addressed in some ways. I mean, we have we have been talking to Sergio Pasco, who really works on brain organoids ad nauseum. And we've been talking to a lot of other folks on the show as well. I've covered a lot of papers in this area in terms of proper integration of human cortical organoids into the the native host architecture. And here what they're doing is they're providing structural and functional evidence that human cortical organoids can integrate with the adult rat visual system after transplantation into a large injury cavity in the visual cortex. So basically made a big injury in the visual cortex of the rat, stuck the, the human cortical organoid in there, and examined whether these things were able to integrate pretty well. So they did transsynaptic tracing after a polysynaptic pathway between the organoid neurons and the, the, the host retina. They're able to show this reciprocal connectivity between the graft and other regions of the visual system. So functionally, and I guess when it comes to the connectivity, it's it's establishing that connectivity between the, the human cortical organoids and the rat visual cortex, which is which is great. And then the other part is the I think the the most exciting part of the paper where they did a visual stimulation of the animal um, that you know otherwise would not be able to see, and the visual stimulation actually was able to elicit a response in the transplanted human organoid in the neurons of the the human cortical organoid including orientation selectivity so that's that's pretty much the paper in a nutshell it's a transplantation model it's a it's an integration examination approach um but i think you can understand why this paper received a lot of press because transplanting human, human cortical organoids into the rat brain and all of a sudden the rat is able to see after this visual uh, uh stimulation you know it, it's it's one of those sci-fi papers. We're having a sci-fi discussion before the show, and this fits right into it. Uh, it's it's, a, it's an interesting approach. 
sci-fi or sci-fact, Arun. I mean, the headlines would lead you to believe that we're on the cusp of, of curing blindness with this. And you can imagine why. I wouldn't say the authors are exactly going for that conclusion. I think uh, being more conservative and measured in their claims and conclusions, they would probably argue that there's like a functional integration of these organoids. And this orientation selectivity, I'm guessing that means that like they're changing their direction in response to light. That is an a, a impressive um, result. But I was just left thinking at the end of this paper, um, having not read it as closely as you did, Arun, that it, it seems like a bit of a jump and not a headline grab. But I would like to see this done with just mouse cortical organoids i mean is that already in the literature and so that it wasn't novel i is there not i i think a, a more sensible approach or a more measured approach where we're doing this to see if we can actually have a more functional improvement using a intraspecies uh cell system as opposed to going right to the xenograft i mean i get it that that we we don't really care about mice vision but as a model, I, I would ask, I don't know if you have the answer, but have we cured blindness with mouse cortical organoids? Because I feel like that would be a more robust system to fine tune before you jump right to these xenograft, which are effectively like kind of tumors in, in the mouse brain. Not tumors, but are foreign growths um, that I don't know how much uh, positive influence they are, notwithstanding the orientation selectivity. Uh, I don't know. They may be having all kinds of other effects there as a as a, a a graph that's really not of the same species, right? Yeah, I don't know. And I'll just go ahead and say, for any of the mice listening to the show, I do care about mouse vision. I'm just saying. I don't know why, you know, you would want to do this in a rat versus a mouse, maybe rats. I, again, I'm an in vitro biologist. I don't do mouse work or rat work, but perhaps rat is a, is a better model system for studying this kind of thing. Perhaps for studying visual acuity or whatnot. Yeah, I think there are definitely a lot of questions. I think there's questions about the overall maturity of the cells, the overall uh, immunosuppression approach that they had to, to, to utilize to make this a reality because this is a xenograft, as you mentioned, and that in itself has a lot of limitations. But hey, proof of concept, right? Yes, and amazing. And I mean, the headlines were totally justified and this is a big paper. I just, I'm, I'm like kind of waiting for some more functional data. And I wish we could see it in a more tractable system, but it probably won't be long the way things are going right around. The pace is so quick. You mentioned the timing and the time scale. So that's a bit of a good segue into my roundup paper here, which is about uh, neural development, but specifically about the, the developmental timing and the time scale there. So, you know, when, when, as embryologists, fundamentally, we all understand that at least within mammals, we all look very much alike in the early stages of development, right? The sequence of events, the order of operations, first the heart, your favorite, then you get the neurophos, all that stuff, organogenesis. And we all pretty much amongst the mammalian kingdom look alike in those first, you know, post gas gastrulation stages. And then it's really just a matter of scale and maturation. Um, so the order of events are, are very similar, but the time scales uh, by which these things happen can be very different. And that's uh, best exemplified perhaps with the human cerebral cortex, which is characterized by a considerably prolonged timing of neural development, taking months to reach maturity. Whereas in mice, this only takes a few weeks, right? So uh, this is something that's thought to underlie the tremendous, you know, big brain qualities of, of the humans, the function and plasticity of the human brain relative to a mouse. But, um, you know, what drives it is unknown. And, and this is something that's conserved, right? If you take human or non-human primate cortical neurons and you culture them in vitro or transplant them into a mouse or rat brain, uh, as you were just describing, they develop um, among along that same uh, species intrinsic timeline. And that suggests that indeed these are cell intrinsic or species intrinsic mechanisms that are governing this developmental timing. But what it what those are and what drives them are pretty much unknown. But there's a lot of hints, right? Nowadays everybody's looking to metabolism, right? And by virtue of metabolism, looking to mitochondria, 
because uh, that metabolism and, and the activity of my mitochondria are, are key drivers of cell fate transitions across many systems. So going with that uh, as a rationale and a basis for this study, Pierre van der Hagen, who's at the Louvain Brain Institute in Belgium, he's called the Big Brain Institute with the, the ideas that came out in this paper, uh, they went with that, that hypothesis that metabolism mitochondria may be at the root of the species intrinsic developmental timing. And to, to test it, they developed this novel system where they could label newly born neurons uh, with very high uh, temporal cellular resolution. This is in mouse, they have these genetically engineered mouse. Um, and then they also had human pluripotent stem cell derived cortical neurons. Uh, and they used those two systems to compare the development of human and mouse cort cortical neurons over time. Um, and what they looked at was the, because the focus was mitochondria metabolism, they looked at the morphology of mitochondria. They looked at gene expression, oxygen consumption, glucose metabolism. They really went across the board to define all of the, the facets of uh, metabolism, mitochondrial action between these two models. And then extended that by uh, using pharmacology or genetics to manipulate uh, neurons to either enhance or decrease uh, the mitochondrial function. And what they found is, you know, what what the the, the lead up here, I kind of bury the lead, but um, they, yeah, uh, mitochondria were the determinants of the, the species-specific tempo. Um, and this was indicated by initial uh, low quantity and, and uh, low uh, uh, small size of mitochondria in newborn neurons that grow and multiply as the neurons undergo maturation. So that was the phenotype over time. Uh, and whereas the mouse uh, reached the mature, uh, quote unquote, mature pattern at around three to four weeks, this only happened after several months in the human neurons, um, as you would expect. So it reflected the phenotype, the mitochondria reflected this phenotype. And also the oxidative activity and glucose metabolism also had this species specific timeline, maturation evidence, at much later time points, months as opposed to weeks in the human versus the mouse, respectively. Um, and then the, the pharmacological and genetic manipulation. This was really, I think, the payoff here is they showed that if they could, could manipulate that, they could get the, they could enhance mitochondrial oxidative metabolism. Um, and those neurons exhibited mature features weeks ahead of time for the human. And this was a key experiment uh, I thought, is that they also were able to show that if they treated, accelerated, the, or increased the mitochondrial activity in mouse neurons, they could lead to even faster maturation, like a matter of seconds, maybe even, who knows. Um, but the key here, I thought, was that they were also able to slow down. If they inhibited mitochondrial metabolism in the mouse neurons, they got a decrease in the developmental rates. Now, whether or not the human could be abbreviated to the time course of the mouse or vice versa, uh, no, you know, this is, these were relative decreases or increases. Um, and it, it remains to be seen whether we'll be able to accelerate to, to those extreme levels. Um, but I think the real takeaway here is this is all we talk about, not all less and less as, as people have been working on it, but maturation state is still a major stumbling block in terms of how do we use pluripotent stem cells to the greatest effect. Um, and this might be an inroad, uh, a tool to accelerate or perhaps decelerate uh, the maturation of human neurons might uh, enable uh, more practical modeling of disease that only afflicts uh, later stage or mature neurons. Uh, also, in terms of cell therapy, who knows? Maybe if we could pick up the pace on these cell diff protocols and get mature cells uh, uh, quicker, uh, you know, we're all about scale nowadays, trying to move these cells into the market and the key way to make them affordable and sustainable is going to be getting them uh, differentiated at, at an economic um, scale. So I thought this really hit a lot of markers for me, Ruin the basic in terms of what it is that dictates maturation, but also the practical in terms of how we can apply it, perhaps, uh, for modeling and for uh, increasing the economy of cell preparation for therapy. Yeah, I like both aspects of this story, like you alluded to, the basic and also the practical. I think the practical side of it is what made it a science paper. I think getting a pharmacological intervention, using that to manipulate the development of these 
these neurons, I think that's really the key to to taking this paper to the next level. I I think over the the last few years we've been on the show, we've covered this a lot, this EODO evolutionary development angle, and in particular how pluripotent stem cell derived neurons and cortical organoids actually can be a really useful and exciting model to study this, to study evolutionary differences in neuronal and uh, neurodevelopment between different species. I mean, here they only compared mouse and and human, which is about, I don't know, 60 million years of divergent evolution, something like that. But I think the other part of this would be to compare species that are a little bit more similar, like human and non-human primates, see how well some of these mechanisms are conserved. Uh, to do a gradient across the entire mammalian tree and maybe even go beyond that. I don't know, to go into reptilian systems and see how well some of these mechanisms are conserved there through hundreds and hundreds of millions of years of divergent evolution, right? So there's a, a million different things you can do with this kind of work. Maybe this is something that they're actually working on, looking at these other species as well. But I actually, I love these kind of stories because it's a it's an angle that we don't always think about in terms of the applications of pluripotent stem cells for studying evolutionary biology, not something we do every day. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And it hadn't occurred to me that, and I think it's a great idea to really open this up and have this be a kind of a standard, a molecular standard by which to measure uh I don't know if it reflects evolution, but at least it, it seems like it definitely affects the, the pace of uh, embryonic development in these cells. And perhaps I was thinking also, um, not just in the brain, right? With these papers, it's kind of a, a breakthrough because you could then have a lot of questions to ask. If we can do this, for example, I'm sure you would care if this would work in the heart, Arun, if we could uh, maybe accelerate maturation um, in, in different systems like the heart where where getting mature cells for therapy is is really critically important and, as I said, it's still a major obstacle. So a lot's going to come out of this paper across the board, Evo, Devo, you know, technical papers, as well as a lot of basic, you know, heavily cited in the future. And we'll look forward to, to seeing that. It's a good point with the heart, and that's 100% true. People are already using metabolic approaches to mature cardiomyocytes. In fact, in fact, Chuck Murray had a number of really papers utilizing metabolic manipulation to enhance cardiomyocyte maturation, ultimately for the purposes of cell therapy, which is something that you alluded to before. So all these things go hand in hand, and this is a, a really, really hot area of study right now. So next, again, continuing on our tirade of neural stories here on this roundup, we love the neurons. We love the brain. We don't know a lot about it, you and me, but we're going to give it a best shot. Okay. We're going to try. So here's another cell stem cell paper. This is uh, titled Natural Variation in Gene Expression and Viral Susceptibility Revealed by Neural Progender Cell Lineages. This is coming from Steve McCarroll and also Kevin Egan. Uh, Steve McCarroll was and is at the Harvard Medical School. First author here is Michael Wells. And this is a, it's a cool approach, I think, in a, in a few different ways. We'll dive into some of the nitty gritty of the, the technical how, know-how and technical approaches here. But human genome variation, as we know, and Steve McCarroll obviously knows, is something that contributes to diversity in neurodevelopmental outcomes. Some people get neurodevelopmental diseases, other people don't. And of course, you know, genetic variation in the genome is a major underlying factor as to why that happens. And it's not just developmental disorders, it's also susceptibility to infections and even diseases that can be caused, neurodiseases that can be caused by viral infections, including Zika virus, which is something that they they studied here. Remember when Zika virus was all the rage and that was the only virus we ever talked about on this show and also in the general public was that just a short five years ago. And then there was something else that happened. I, I can't recall what that was. But anyways, they are they're using a cell village, quote unquote, experimental platform to analyze the genetic, molecular, and phenotypic heterogeneity across different neural progenitor cells from 44, get this, 44 different human donors cultured in a shared in vitro environment. This is what they called a cell village. Okay. So they made these cells from a bunch of different people, threw them all in a vat, and then saw how they interact with each other and saw that they were able to actually distinguish each other, each of those cell types, uh, those backgrounds from each other in that population. So it, it is a village. The village got crowded, but they could still piece apart 
the single people in that village and really dissect them uh, one by one, which I think is really neat. And how did they do that? They did a lot of single cell RNA sensing, as you might expect. If there are a bunch of different cells of different genetic backgrounds in a single population, you would have to use single cell to really dissect those mechanisms. Okay. So they, the other part of this is in addition to that cell village approach, how they actually made neural progenitor cells from pluripotent stem cells is pretty exciting. They had this very, very rapid differentiation approach where they basically just overexpressed NGN2, a common, uh, well-known neurodevelopmental factor, and were able to get these neural progenitor cells within, I believe, like a few days, which is really exciting. So after this pooling approach and differentiating them into these NPCs in a couple of days, they looked at drivers of natural genetic variation through deep sequencing, did some CRISPR-Cas9 genetic perturbations, and actually ultimately found a common variant that regulates antiviral IFITM3 expression, which is critical for susceptibility to the Zika virus. So this is bringing it back to the virus, okay? So in this pool of 44 uh, different types of cells from different genetic backgrounds, they were still able to piece apart a mechanism as to why some of the cells in that population were susceptible to Zika and other cells weren't. So it's it's a really neat approach. Um, and then they took it a step further. They actually did some organoid work in here as well. I think that was a bit separate from their, their pooled approach, but also found a few um, loci that can enhance susceptibility and decrease susceptibility to Zika infection, um, uh, enhance the susceptibility of these progenitors to be infected by Zika, including this gene CACHD1. So I think they're, I really like this approach because this paper, because there's a bunch of unique approaches all pooled together, pieced together uh, to, to make this story really pop out. And that's this cell village approach. This is there's the the speed differentiation approach, which I really liked. And then the Zika angle too, which I think all brings it together to make it a really nice cell stem cell paper. I'm just surprised to hear you, you know, waxing longingly about the days of microcephaly. I mean, I was I'm I'm happy for those <laughs> days to be over. <laughs> yeah. But uh <laughs> hey, bring it back. Um, no, uh, in all seriousness, I'm I'm right with you. I mean, this one thing is this this GWAS in a dish. We I feel like we just talked about GWAS in a dish in a recent um, episode, and clearly that's now just a thing. And that's so amazing to me. The tech we've reached the point both on on both ends, uh, you know, being able to manipulate the genome, which they don't do here, but the 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 seek, you know, the seek at high resolution with single cells is what made this possible. But I'm totally with you. I love to read a paper like this because it reminds me of the days when we were just trying shit, sorry, excuse my French, you gotta beep that out if you need to, but that's the, I gotta say it, when we were just trying stuff, you know, throwing stuff against the wall, uh, and, and, and hey, that works, like this village thing, and then the rapid NGN, it seems like almost anachronistic that the, they're doing things um, that just are brand new, so I, I really enjoy, I'm not surprised to see this um, come out of, you know, the Harvard Stem Cell Institute and all those those uh, august uh, investigators there, including um, Kevin Egan and uh, Stephen McCarroll. I mean, no surprise there, but I, I'm I'm inspired by stories like this. When, it, when I read it, I just want to go into the lab and throw some stuff against the wall. How about you, Arlo? Yeah, I'll let you do that. <laughs> no, I, I agree. I agree. I don't do cell culture. I do cell culture. I, not as much anymore, but I I appreciate the work. And in fact, Steve McCarroll's lab was right next to my, my postdoc lab in Boston. So I can vouch for the quality of the, the stuff that they do. I mean, they are one of the world's leaders when it comes to all things sequencing. It's really such a powerhouse. One thing that I thought was interesting about this paper was the the NGN2 overexpression approach to actually make those NPCs, neural progenitor cells, really, really quick, like in a matter of days. They apparently couldn't do that with human NGN2. They could only do it with mouse, which I thought was really interesting because you've got human iPSCs that you're looking at, and it's only when you drive with mouse NGN2 when to get a, a, a bona fide human NPC in like four days, but it, it doesn't work with human NGN2. I just thought that was really interesting. And going back to the evolutionary stuff that we were just talking about, 
how different is human and mouse NGN2? I would expect it to be not that different, but just a few amino acids different and you can or cannot make norprogenitor cells, which is bizarre. Yeah, it is bizarre, but welcome to throwing stuff against the wall, Arun. I mean, the human <laughs> NGN2 clearly didn't stick. And so the mouse NGN2, that's what got in here and, and whatever works, right? With all these experimental systems from the drop, I mean, we're using embryonic stem cells that don't really exist. So don't be talking to me about physiology. Um, anyway, uh, an interesting story from an interesting lab. And following from that, uh, Agin. You know, he's got quite a uh, scientific uh, diaspora and lineage. A lot of great minds have come out of that lab. Um, we covered papers from Evangelos Kiskinos recently uh, about the biomimetic uh, scaffold ECM, which was at the ISSCR. Here's a paper. We've covered his stuff before, but here's a paper from uh, Justin Achita, who, who just went off uh, last month. He has been working toward this for, you know, over a decade, of course. Um, but it all came down to two major papers uh, in the last couple of weeks that were in cell and cell stem cell. And it's about ALS, his baby. I mean, he's the one moving the field. Kevin Egan as well led led the way with a bunch of other um, investigators. But I, I have to hand it to uh, Justin Achita. I mean, he's really done so much great work along these lines. And, you know, ALS, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, fast progressing, neurodegenerative. You know, the key here is motor neuron loss paralysis. Yeah, death, right? But the key is the rapidity. You know, within two to five years of onset, most of these patients are dead. Um, so, and there's no real therapies because there's a lot of diverse um, etiologies and while there is like a conserved for, uh, form, a genetic form, um, which is relatively rare among cases, uh, for, for most cases, that etiology is unknown, probably uh, due to a spectrum of genes. Um, so one of the toughest things and the greatest goals, the holy grail of ALS treatment has been to find pathways that will work for multiple forms of ALS. And this was uh, both these papers, I think, grew out of a story that was published in Nature Medicine about five years ago, where the Cheetah Lab identified um, this PIC5 inhibition amongst a candidate that reversed motor neuron death in um, these patient specific motor, motor neurons, induced motor neurons in a big screen. He identified this. And so the first paper here, or one of the two papers, um, that came out was really just uh, unpacking that, you know, showing that the the way that the PIC, the inhibition of PIC5 kinase uh, works is that it, it activates this, the inhibition results in this um, unconventional protein clear, clearance mechanism and exocytosis of these aggregation prone proteins, namely this TDP43, which is a TAR DNA binding protein 43, which is a key factor, aggregation of which um, can lead to the motor neuron death. So it, uh, the inhibition of PIK5 causes uh, exocytosis of those uh, proteins amongst others, and this ameliorates the ALS pathology, extends the survival of animals as well as the patient-derived motor neurons. And the keys here are that it's motor neurons from diverse patients, both the, the genetically predicted ALS form, but also these um, ones of unknown etiology. And in the mice, in vivo, you know, not just in the cell lines, but in vivo, there's these great videos of two mice in a cage, and one of them's all banged up, and the other one is just chilling. So uh, this is really impressive, I think, results, just looking at, at how this works and whether or not it can be leveraged therapeutically. I think we're very close um, I think the Achita Lab and us collectively as a society are very close owing to this work. The other paper I was more interested in because it was a little bit more novelty. I mean, a lot of mechanism in the cell paper, totally deserving um, and unpacking that. But for me, the, the new candidate here that was identified in this cell stem cell paper was really exciting. And that was, I think it's important to say, based on this idea that... Uh, you could, you know, develop a screening platform, the phenotypic screening. That's what we're doing with the modeling, right? But uh, the key here that I think was novel is that, you know, the small molecule drug screens uh, that are, you know, in in wide use uh, are restricted to the druggable genome, right? And now with all these alternative therapies, namely uh, antisense oligonucleotide, which I know have been 
in play for a long time, but now are kind of dribbling in to uh, practice and, and clinical trials and showing great promise um, that you use antisense, you can perturb any N RNA target, right? So you can move beyond the, the pharma paradigm and also have much more specificity in terms of your targeting. As we always talk about, these drugs can blow up every compartment. Um, and what they did here is they combined the small molecule target approach, right? And then they did a lot of... Uh, uh, bioinformatic analysis and public data sets to identify perturbations that would be similar, you know, similar to transcriptional changes, um, where they would yield similar transcriptional changes to those that they identified with their chemical hits, right? So they were looking for anti-sense approaches that would reflect that, that drugging that they were doing to offer that specificity. And they found a bunch of candidates and showed that if you suppress this spliceosome associated factor, SYF2, SYF2, you alleviate the aggregation of that TDP43 protein, you alleviate the mislocalization, you improve the activity of that protein, its native activity. And this rescues not only that C9 ORF72, the genetic, um, the cause of ALS, but also sporadic ALS. It rescues neuron survival in both those patient backgrounds. Um, and ameliorates uh, neurogeneration, neuromuscular junction loss, and motor dysfunction in mice that are a model of mice, these TDP43 mice. So this, in addition to the PIK5, which I think, I don't know about ready for prime time, but I think we could at least consider now that uh, the Cheetah Lab has unpacked the mechanism of how it works. Um, in addition to that, I think we have this another novel candidate that could maybe enter this new uh, anti-sense pipeline and be a, 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 an effective therapeutic approach for ALS. And the key here is effective for all types ALS. And that's the holy grail, Arun. Yeah, uh, this is a situation in ALS where we do want to throw everything against the wall, like what you've said before uh, a couple minutes ago. Yeah, ALS is brutal. It's something we discussed with Clive Svensson, my postdoc mentor here on the show not too long ago, who also works on ALS, also not too far away down the road from USC here at Cedars. We're just like four or five miles apart, you know, ALS powerhouse here in Los Angeles. Uh, come visit us. But yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a disease that we need to know a lot about. But I, I agree with you. I think the exciting part of both these papers is integrating both the familial and sporadic ALS data sets here and approaches because it is it's not just one or the other we have to ideally develop something a therapeutic that can target both forms of the disease and uh it is a disease as i've said again and again that is brutal and so everything everything helps here yeah i mean i was thinking about that in the time between uh, a cheetah lab publishing that paper in nature medicine five years ago and now all the patients that were diagnosed presumably have died so i mean the pace of the research cannot be fast enough and i think that this really is a major step forward and also not just this but all the papers that we published today are talked about today if only i had published all those papers i'd be swimming in it but um they all reflect i think the mission uh, of the ISSCR moving forward, which is this emphasis on translation. And although I, you wouldn't have heard me saying it 10 years ago, five years ago even, it seems like the neural compartment is where a, a lot of these early therapies are going to make a big splash. So I think appropriate that we've gone deep in the brain today uh, and hopefully we can follow up with that with some conversation with the leadership of the ISSCR about how the brain is really at the point of the spear in terms of our therapeutic intervention and the great potential there. But before we get there, I have a quick message from Stem Cell Technologies. Whether you're looking to attend ISSCR 2023 or to expand your network, make the most out of your experience by downloading our collection of tools to help you prepare for your next event. Stem Cell Technologies downloadable checklists and guides include recommendations on how to get ready before attending conferences, tips for networking, best practices for your LinkedIn profile, and more. Download the conference toolkit at www.stemcell.com slash conference dash toolkit. Okay, gang, as mentioned, today we have a special ISSCR pre-conference episode where we'll flesh out some of the details and new offerings at the ISSCR annual meeting 
sponsored by Blue Rock Therapeutics and taking place in Boston from June 14th to 17th. Joining us today are Keith Alm, CEO of the ISSCR, Haifan Lin, President of the ISSCR and Professor at Yale School of Medicine, and David Scadden, Program Chair of this year's meeting and Professor at Harvard University. Thanks so much, gentlemen, for joining us for this show. Thanks for having us back. All right, happy to have you back. Uh, all right, team, let's start off with the venue. Boston is home to more than a thousand biotech companies, and that makes sense with five of the top six NIH-funded independent hospitals in the U.S. and literally hundreds of trailblazing scientists, if not thousands, and physicians at academic institutes in Boston and Cambridge. In fact, Kendall Square, Stone's Throw from the conference, has 120 companies within a mile and has been described as the center of the nation's biotech industry, an appropriate venue for sharing a lot of science that is truly on the precipice of clinical translation. Hi, Fun, let's start with you. As president of the ISSCR, what are the overall points of emphasis for this year's conference, and how does that intersect with Boston's reputation as the center of the nation's biotech industry? Well, Dylan, thank you. We are very excited about holding this meeting in Boston this year. Because, as you said, it's one of the largest biotech research cities in the world, and it also has a vibrant stem cell research community. So by holding this meeting in Boston, the attendees uh, can take the advantage of contacting a lot of experts in the field, not only in the academic side, but also in the biotech industry side, to build new connections, to feel the vibe, and to build uh, potential collaborations. Um, also, you know, in the meeting, we have a virtual option for our global community, but we do expect this to be one of the largest in-person meetings in recent years for the ISCR. So by coming together to Boston, that's a city, very easy to be flown in from all over the world. We really feel this meeting will provide a special platform for people to get together, you know, after this long period of silence uh, during the COVID uh, pandemic. And uh, this meeting has a few big features. I just wanna, uh, you know, describe them in brief strokes. So it's going to be organized into five themes to help attendees to find and connect with researchers with common interests. And these themes will be going through both the Plenary and concurrent sessions that David will describe more. And uh, also, you know, there are more than 100 abstract selected speakers in the program in the concurrent track sessions, which are associated with these themes. So there are lots of exciting science that are going to be presented. And finally, I also like to express my uh, personal thanks to our co sponsor, Blue Rock Therapeutics, and all of our partners who are supporting the meeting. Yeah, it's really going to be a tremendous meeting. We are definitely looking forward to it. It's always a highlight of ours every single year to to cover the ISSCR annual meeting. And part of the the reason that it's such a great meeting is the the amazing science, all the incredible research that's in, currently in progress, and the wealth of submitted abstracts that are going to be highlighted at the the annual meeting. So, what can we expect to see in the program, and what motivated these selections? And uh, just as a reminder. There is a call for late-breaking abstracts for poster presentations February 22nd to March 22nd. So, Dr. Scadden, what are you the most excited about when it comes to the, the program itself? Uh, thanks, Ryan. I think there are a lot of very interesting aspects to this, but let me touch upon some of the speakers that are getting awards and that we're asking to do particular presentations. So, one of them is our keynote speaker, Richard Klausner. And many of you may know him from having been the chief of the National Cancer Institute for many years at the NIH. And, um, and he is also, you know, he's a very innovative thinker. And he's recently decided that some of the technologies that were developed in the stem cell field, the idea of being able to reprogram the fate of cells, is something that can, in a sense, rewind the history of cells. We've all seen that in vitro. But his idea, and an idea that's been now demonstrated in a number of laboratories, is that this can happen in vivo as a way to essentially restore an earlier state, a more vigorous state, to be able to regenerate tissues in all of us as we age. And so he's established a new way of doing this science, which is to gather private philanthropic dollars, 
actually private dollars and form a company, that they will try to then use this emerging science to create new medicines. And so his insight into both the, the utility of some of the basic science in our field and also novel ways in which you can organize that science so that you can have big new approaches for therapies is something that we're asking him to speak on. And I think he'll be great for that. Uh, we also have a number of outstanding award uh, lectures that are going to be presented, which I'm really excited about. So one, you know, every year we have a young scientist that's uh, awarded. And this year it's Takanori Takibi. Uh, and I think his work, which is really looking at how the liver, one of our most regenerative organs, is capable of doing that and how it may be possible to understand liver disease, but also uh, new therapies to get regeneration of a damaged liver uh, is very interesting. And we'll hear more about that. Uh, we also have a so-called Momentum Award, which is uh, this year going to Cedric Blancpain. And Cedric is a very innovative scientist who works on epithelial uh, stem cells and has thought about ways in which you can use emerging technologies to understand how individual cells and their descendants can contribute to tumor complexity and also to ways in which the tumor will behave as a counterpoint to the way normal cells behave. So I think uh, Cedric um, always gives a, a great lecture, and this is one I'm really looking forward to. Um, and that's an achievement award from Tom Rando, who uh, I have to say, I think Tom has really been a, a tremendous contributor to this field. His work really um, taught us a tremendous amount about muscle stem cells in particular, but also about broad areas of uh, the process of aging and how it impacts regeneration. And through his pioneering work on the use of, of um, parabiotic um, mice has shown us that, that the aging state of poor regeneration is reversible and has the potential to be able to be manipulated so that we can restore a more rejuvenative context for um, adult tissues. So I think that's great. And then uh, finally, we have our uh, Public Service Award, whose appropriate uh, recipient this year is Christine Mummery. Uh, Christine's been a, just a terrific champion of both the science and the society. She was a former, uh, she was a former president of the society, was the founding editor-in-chief of Stem Cell Reports, has done a great deal as a mentor and also a contributor to really uh, thoughtful um, uh, public policy uh, statements and has a, a done pioneering work on her own in terms of cardiovascular development. So I, I think this is really gonna shape up to be a uh, highlighting of some of our stars, but they are really just the, the peak of uh, what is, I think, a very broad-based community around the themes that we have organized for um, this meeting. Uh, the first speaker, Professor Robert Langer from MIT, is one of the few most extraordinary inventors of our time. His pioneering work on biomaterials and nanomedicine and tissue engineering have paved the way for many breakthroughs in tissue engineering and in controlled molecular delivery uh, during the drug design. And our second speaker, Magdalena zenekar Ghost, is a professor from University of Cambridge and Caltech. Uh, she is a world leader in the study of embryogenesis. Among her many contributions, her lab pioneered the in vitro three-dimensional stem cell models to recap and to investigate the process of embryonic development. And we have a, a rising star, Nan Tang from uh, the National Institute of Biological Sciences in China. Uh, she has made key contributions to our understanding of uh, long development, repair, and how alveolar epithelial cells perform their distinct functions in long homeostasis and in diseases. And last speaker, uh, Professor Helen Blau from Stanford University uh, is a world leader in stem cell research who has made seminal contributions to muscle stem cell biology from the identification to their mechanistic studies and clinical applications. So she actually is delivering 
the Ernest McLeod Memorial Lecture. So indeed, uh, it's a very exciting program. Yeah, well, one of the greatest things for me about the ISSC annual meeting is it gives a chance for us all to recognize the talents and at multiple career levels. And I think that's a great uh, facet of it. Looking back on conferences over the years, it really forms this beautiful tapestry of achievement and innovation that I think we all appreciate. Um, but, you know, on another note, you go to any conference, not ISSCR, any conference, literally, it seems like there's a solid 50 plus percent of the attendees that are grumbling about what could have been done better at the poster session. Everyone's always grumbling about the poster session, especially with the digital. It's been a tough adjustment uh, with the pandemic and all the different ways that we're uh, disseminating science. There's some new changes this year to get that grumbling to a minimum. Uh, David or Haifan, uh, whoever wants to weigh in on this, can you describe uh, some of the changes to the poster session and how that will benefit the attendees? Well, if I may have fun, I'll just jump in and then you can add if it's okay. You know, I, I think the posters, these are always areas where I think if people can connect with others in their field, it's the greatest way to develop collaborative relationships to get to know the people on a personal level in your field. And so it, in many ways, it can be the most productive. That has been lost a lot with uh, what we've had to do during during COVID. But I, I think in now this year being in person and uh, with hopefully a lot of people in attendance, we'll be able to rekindle some of that. But we're also trying to organize it so the poster tracks match with the ongoing themes for the oral sessions. And just to remind you, those themes are really in five larger buckets. Um, I'm going to highlight the one that I think is so important, which is clinical applications and really the translation of our science to, to human care. Um, the other is this issue of regeneration around tissue stem cells regeneration, modeling development and using those models to help us understand disease, uh, the new technologies that are emerging, which give us new insight into how tissues and organs function in the context of normal development and, uh, and settings of injury. And then finally, uh, the last one, which is cellular identity, which relates to this topic that I mentioned initially of, uh, of how do we, we now have the ability to essentially regard the cell as a programmable unit. And so greater understanding of what are the things that give cells their particular identity, how modulable they may be, and how one could potentially use that manipulable system to create new cell states that can be therapeutic is the other area. So those are the big five tracks, connecting the posters with the oral sessions. Uh, I think hopefully we'll be able to allow people to sort of zoom in to their particular community where they can make this the most, uh, the most productive for them. Yeah, I think uh, David articulated this year's uh, exciting features of uh, poster session really well. I just want to simply add that, you know, we've allocated ample time for these poster sessions uh, in the good uh, period of the day and night, so people can really take advantage of that to interact with each other. One of the one of the feedback pieces of feedback that we got from members last time was that they would like more time for. Uh, for for networking and social activities in, in the evening. And so part of this uh, adjustment of when the poster sessions fall during the program is to try to accommodate that. And this is the first year we're piloting that. So it'll be interesting to see how people people respond and how we'll continue to evolve this in the future to make it the most impactful it can be. Yeah, it's no doubt that the, the social aspects of these meetings are always a highlight. I mean, that's especially important for the trainees, junior investigators to get to know each other and to network. It's a, always a big part of meetings. So, you know, Dr. Scott, you actually mentioned that the translational focus of the stem cell work that's going on these days. And with the pace of research and the entry of, you know, many of these cell therapy candidates into clinical trials, the, the impact of the work is moving beyond the lab really fast. And there's so many examples of this. And this year, as we talked about, the ICCR has a bunch of new tracks, including the ethics policy and standard track. So Keith, why don't you actually talk about a little bit about what we can expect from that track? Because that's especially important these days. Yeah, well, I'll just say, the, you know, those research ethics, you know, policy um, and uh, and standards uh, are so important to the, to the work that ICCR is doing in addition to our meeting work. You know, one of the things that ICCR does very well is convene our community around 
tough issues and come up with uh, with solutions and and guidance uh, for the future. And I think these three topics are really representative of that. The ethics um, track uh, or ethics uh, session will focus on public engagement. Um, policy will talk broadly about uh, different um, global challenges that we face in in policy. Uh, and then the standards initiative, which has been a really important focus of the society over the past uh, 18 months, uh, will really be a a reveal of what has been uh, uh, almost two years of work uh, going into establishing some basic standards for rigor and reproducibility um, in the field. You know, these three topics are so important to the field, but they've been kind of ancillary programs to the meeting uh, in the past. So we've made them part of the main program to really emphasize their importance and also get members engaged in some of the other uh, initiatives that the ICCR has been working on. Yeah, for me, I mean, I'm excited about all these new, new tracks, but I, I keep coming back for those can't miss uh, sessions. And one of those is the, the presidential symposium, which for me is a can't miss uh, because it puts the spotlight on both the leadership and science that's really moving the field at the leading edge. Uh, I also like to think of it as the ISSCR president shortlist, which gives a window into their thinking about the past, present, and future of stem cell research. This year, we'll be hearing from Helen Blau, Robert Langer, Nan Tang, and Magdalena Zernica Goats, all titans in the field. Hi, Fun, give us a peek into that deep well of a mind you have. What drove these choices? Sure, thank you, Dylan. I'm just as excited about this presidential symposium as you are, because it really is focusing on a theme that's central to the stem cell research, namely, the theme of advancing stem cell research through innovation. And particularly, this symposium was designed to have a threefold significance. First, it aims to showcase some of the most innovative work across the spectrum of stem cell research and regenerative medicine. That means from fundamental discoveries to ingenious applications, and also from embryonic stem cells to adult stem cells. And the second, for those significance is that we are also taking this opportunity to highlight women scientists from three major continents, namely Asia, Europe, and North America, to showcase their cutting edge work. And the third, uh, you know, for the significance is that we really want to feature both rising stars and world leaders in this symposium. So as you can, you can see from the four speakers that, that whose name you've just mentioned. Yeah, that's part of the thing I really love about the ISCR annual meeting is the ability to highlight some of these rising stars, junior investigators, and diversifying the field and diversifying its membership, which is a very important thing. You know, lowering the barrier to entry to stem cell sciences is critically important these days, as many folks around the world are getting more involved in this field. And, you know, this year, there's actually a number of new initiatives like child care dependent care grants to help facilitate and attending the meeting in person, standards and ICCR digital initiatives, clinician education efforts, lowering the membership for students. So, Keith, tell us, you know, about what's new, some of these new things outside of the science, but that are really important to the ICCR in particular. Well, I think you nailed it when you talked about accessibility, you know, the, the ability to have some of these uh, programs. Programs or sessions broadcast digitally is very important to our to our global audience, but also for those traveling uh, to uh, to the meeting. I think that the introduction of a family travel grant award is really important. You know, I'm the the dad to uh, two little kids, and I know very well uh, the difficulty of getting to all the conferences you want to get to and manage childcare and and other dependent care. And and so I hope that this is a helpful way for us to make the meeting more accessible to those. Um, in the in the in the community, you know, the other thing that that Hyphen and I have been really focused on this year too is trying to find new ways to bring our membership uh, into ICCR programming and really be a part not only of speaking at some of the ICCR programs but also in the development uh, of them uh, as well. And I think that the scientific spotlights uh, sessions that will be at this annual meeting are, are a real indication uh, of of that. Um, and I wonder if uh, Hyphen or David, if if maybe you want to comment a little bit on what those uh, what those are and uh, what we might expect to see. I think this uh, science spotlight sessions are amazing because it really is providing a unique opportunity for members to propose, to organize, and to run their own sessions in the meeting. 
So this will allow members to discover exciting topics that might otherwise not be noticed by the program committee. And also we'll let members to take the initiative and uh, you know feel the sense of ownership uh, to this meeting. Yeah, and I would just add to that, I found that, um, I think these were really specifically designed so that trainees are the ones who are doing the organizing. So we have a chance to have people feel that they are, you know, they have um, some agency in forming what will be the program. So we got a very good response to this. I'd say it's very encouraging that so many people took it upon themselves to think what are interesting areas, who are the speakers that are leading those, and among those, we had then really, in many ways, the tyranny of choice. Um, and, and what we decided to focus on in selecting them were things that were not otherwise very well covered in the, the meeting. And so uh, we wanted to identify things that are certainly topics of broad interest, but might and might deserve actually a special session. So here are things about inner ear organoids, for example, and how the efforts to try to use the stem cell approach to reverse uh, this is really, I think, a fantastic area. And not so different from that, but it's also the issue of how do we try to use stem cells for smoke or care um, and focusing not just on uh, reprogrammed cells, but um, also on, on how one might do that with cells that are uh, provided or, or modifying the cells that are in place. And I think that'll also be a super interesting session. So the idea that these come with, I think the enthusiasm of the organizers, but also I hope a sense that these are by and for junior investigators will be something that will add a unique dimension and that will help galvanize people's engagement with the society and the meeting. You know, at some point you talked about the importance of, you know, of uh, of researchers earlier in their career and the importance of of students, and and one of the things that we introduced at ISSCR this year for the first time was a we split up our traditional trainee uh, membership category and added a student membership category at a more affordable price, and we've actually extended that uh, for uh, registration pricing as well. So. A message for the students out there. Uh, we've tried to make this meeting uh, a, a more affordable uh, one to attend this year and, and uh, hope that makes a difference. Yeah, I mean, it is the junior investigators and the trainees that are the lifeblood of the field, and, and they really do move it. And they've, they're the reason why we've arrived at this really pivotal moment. Um, and just circling back to that, you know, the keynote, that final talk, uh, for me, it's kind of representative of the greater theme, perhaps, or, or maybe not sometimes, but it, I think it just goes beyond the standard science talk from an academic. Uh, last year was Priscilla Chan Zuckerberg, and she had a great message that kind of lay within the cross-section of her metal, medical expertise and philanthropic vision. Um, and this year, is, as you described there briefly, David, we've got Richard Klausner, chief scientist and founder of Altos Labs. Um, all of you guys, is there any kind of representation? What do you think that means uh, to have this person who's kind of straddling the academic and, and, and clinical translational? How is that representative of this year's meeting and, and how you envision uh, the society moving forward in the, in the next few years or decades? Well, I'll just start if I may, which is just to say, I think Richard is a guy who is not doing business as usual, right? This is what he is doing, is saying, let's let's boldly take a step beyond what would be the next incremental step in cell reprogramming. Let's think about how we can do that in a way that really accelerates the pace with which it can be applied. And let's do it in a context where we aren't bound by the traditional structures of an academic setting. And I think that's a great experiment on so many levels that it, if it can take root within our community, it would be a great contribution to science broadly, that we ought to have a way in which now there's a path forward for thinking about something other than the usual government-funded or uh, foundation-funded research and really have um, put together the best of the best to create new ideas in ways that might be able to leapfrog what is the uh, the usual bounds of of science? 
You asked about the direction of the society in the future, too. And I think that's also indicative of where the society is heading. You see so much more of a focus on on uh, on on clinical translation and in, uh, in, in this program and innovation uh, as well. And you're going to see the society focusing on things like clinician education and clinical standards uh, in, in the future, too. So I do think it's telling of the direction that we're heading in. Hi, fine. I'm going to let you finish us up here as president for this last year, which I think has been a really pivotal year in academic science with all the synthetic embryos and these new models of of human embryogenesis, the black box that has been impenetrable up until recent years and recent advances. But that's in academia. And ISSCR is really on the kind of straddling that line, right, between the, this translational effort and, and academia in a way that is so expansive. Uh, it's amazing that we can fit it into this four-day conference. Why don't you reflect on this past year, what it's meant to you and, and what you feel about the society moving forward? Um, as uh, Keith has said, you know, uh, we well articulated the society is really expanding from the fundamental research side to the clinical and the industrial application side. So actually, I like the word uh, expanding better than struggling because that shows the dynamics. And uh, we are really at the verge of uh, translating a lot of uh, basic discoveries to the application side. And uh, again, relate back to the city of Boston, you know, many of these things are happening actually in Boston. And uh, I think by holding this meeting in Boston and have people there, I think there's a chance to have people really even interacting among the meeting attendants to feel this uh, trend of, uh, you know, expansion uh, in stem cell research. And, uh, you know, I really feel, you know, this is just the beginning. And in the next several years, the entire field will be systematically moving towards that direction. And uh, in my uh, own institution, we are actually talking about a systematic expansion of uh, Stem Cell Institute to the broader regenerative medicine realm. And that just an uh, example that echoes the overall trend. Well said by all of you, and we really appreciate you guys sharing, giving us a preview of this year's conference. I have to say, we're so excited. One note of disappointment I have to share is that there was no grant mechanism for Red Sox tickets, but I guess I'll get over it and have to <laughs> dig into my own funds. But uh, nevertheless, guys, this has been a really great chat, and I, I can't wait to meet with you guys in person. Hopefully, we can uh, discuss in real time. Uh, some of these amazing innovations and, and the future directions of the ISSCR. Thank you guys again so much. Thanks for having us. We'll look forward to seeing you there. All right, gang, that brings us to the end of this episode. Don't forget to subscribe to our newsletter at www.stemcellpodcast.com to get the show notes, including an episode summary and links to all the interview and roundup papers. You can also reach out to us on Twitter at Stem Cell Podcast or via email at info at stemcellpodcast.com with feedback or to suggest guests. I just looked at the Juno Live thing, Arun, for uh, the ISSCR meeting because I like to get ahead of it. And there are three months, 24 days, and six hours until the first session. I can't wait. I'm really looking forward to it. And talking to the leadership of the ISSCR on that, this episode really got me even more juiced and amped. I hope uh, listening to the show, you guys feel similarly Thank you for listening. Uh, we'll be back with you in a couple weeks.